Welcome to this premiere episode of the One Take Podcast. Today, we'll be diving into the first two episodes of Disney's The Mandalorian. I've got my good friend Jeremy, big Star Wars fan, with me and my brother Alun. So with that, let's jump right into it. So it's finally here, Disney Plus, The Mandalorian. It's all been released. So we're here to recap and review the first two episodes of the series, which uh, the first one came out on Tuesday with the service, and then the second one came out on Friday, and I think the plan is every Friday they're coming out. So this is kind of a special twofer for the first one. I'm Gil, and I'm here with Jeremy. Say hello. Hello. And Alun. Hey there. So before we jump into the episodes, I thought we could do some general uh, Star Wars Disney Plus talk. Kind of, kind of prove our cred, our Star Wars cred. So first off, Disney Plus. Have you checked out any of their other offerings yet? Have you explored the service at all, or has it literally just been uh, Mandalorian? Just Mandalorian. <laughs> what about you, Jeremy? Uh, it was Mandalorian, and then when I finished watching one of them, it recommended that I would also like The Empire Strikes Back, um, <laughs> which is true. So I then I watched that also. But mostly Mandalorian. And none of you have checked out High School Musical, the musical, or the movie, the musical? <laughs> Not yet. I, I know a lot of people have been upset that they don't have the Star Wars uh, Christmas special. Mm. You heard about this? <laughs> I have. And John Favreau has said, and he's clarified that he wasn't joking, that he is interested in making a new Star Wars holiday special. Well, they reference it, not to jump in, but he, he the, uh, the blue guy, Horatio right? character, uh, says like, "Oh, I might make it home for Life Day," which is yeah. the, <laughs> was the um, from the holiday special. That's right. Yeah. So that's what. And by the way, that's what one of the things you can look forward to: Easter eggs. Which <laughs> <laughs> that might be it. <laughs> that would be the only one because that was the one that I had too. So <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was the same for me, Disney+. Plus. I haven't watched any of their other offerings, but I probably will when all the Marvel stuff starts coming out, too. It's also High School, mus- high school Musical, the series, I believe, is the new thing, on because it was already a movie. So it's High School Musical, the musical, the series. So maybe uh, if there's ever an off week where there's no Mandalorian, <laughs> we, can cover, we can cover an episode of uh, that show. And then call it... High School, school musical, musical, the Musical, the, musical, the Series, the, the podcast. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you mentioned Empire Strikes Back. So one other surprise on Disney Plus is that they have re-released the original Star Wars trilogy in 4K. But as always, Alon, what do they do every time they release re-release the Star Wars movies? Uh, they tweak them. Re- yeah. They make little changes. Replace guns with walkie-talkies? Uh, like an E.T.? Yeah. <laughs> Jeremy, do you know what the change was that they made it to uh, the original Star Wars and New Hope? It, just for this specific yeah. release? No, I don't actually. I, I think you know I it? might know. I saw something. Is it related to Han shooting first? Yes. So originally, so Jeremy, you probably know the background on Han shot first versus Greedo. Right. What's the fill us in for people who aren't as so entrenched? In, in the original, original release of Star Wars, when it was just called Star Wars, Han shoots Greedo first but then when they did the uh updated stuff for I think a VHS release was the was the next piece of it mm-hmm. they made it so that Greedo shoots first and Han's shot is you know uh, in retaliation so Han doesn't look like such a <laughs> terrible guy that just you know shoots, shoots without somebody. <laughs> any provocation so they've changed the scene again And basically what happens this time is Han and Greedo are sitting down and then the camera cuts to a close-up of Greedo yelling, McConkey! And then there's an explosion of a laser so you can't see who's shooting and then Greedo is, is dead. What is, does that? What do we gain from that? Can't, couldn't you put it together? What happened, right? Or, well, so now it's ambiguous. So now the implication is they both shot simultaneously, but Han's a better shot. Like a duel. Right. What was so, that word? McConkey. Was there were there subtitles? No, I don't think I don't think it's been translated. Mm-hmm. But if Prob- you, the actor who played Greedo in an interview recently gave some theories on what it could mean. It probably meant something like attack. Maybe. Why would he yell attack right before yeah. attacking? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. Wait. So is the idea that that makes Han slightly more 
villainous because they shoot at the same time instead of Greedo shoots then Han shoots. I think that's what it say, is. Middle ground. I think it's supposed to be a middle ground. Mm. And, and you could say maybe he did shoot first, but there's a cloud of you. You literally can't see what's happening right. in this newer version. So they solved it. They fixed. They finally fixed Star Wars. So we can finally put this to bed. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right, well, let's get into what we're all here to actually talk about, The Mandalorian. Before going into this, what were your expectations of this show? The first ever live-action Star Wars TV show. Uh, I mean, for, for me, I not to sound pessimistic, but I was setting the bar pretty low. I also knew that I would be excited for it almost either way. I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, I don't want to say fanboy, but like I like most Star Wars things. I'm not mm-hmm. looking to go in and nitpick and say why I hate it and how why can't every movie just be A New Hope. Uh, but I wasn't I wasn't going in with crazy expectations at all. Yeah, got it. Yeah, I was kind of the same. Uh, it, the, when the trailer started coming out, that's when I started thinking this actually looks like pretty good, and I was cautiously optimistic. Along the yeah. oh, same wavelength. Yeah, basically, I it, it looked it looked really cool to me, which was worrying me because I didn't want to get my hopes up. It, it looked like a just this western space cowboy type show it, the concept just seemed really cool to me and i didn't want to get my hopes up just to get them broken and so far i'm really enjoying it yeah same so, here pleasantly surprised agreed so let's jump into episode one of the mandalorian the first thing you see or the one of the first things you notice is this new you know how marvel before all of their movies they have the marvel logo appear and you see all these this montage of uh, various clips and everything so it looks like Star Wars has their version of that now. They're going to brand, I'm assuming, all their Star Wars shows with this, where it's sort of a kind of a quick flash of different helmets and droids, and then it says Star Wars. Yeah. So I, thought, yeah, go I, on, go I, ahead. I, I mean, it, it looks cool visually. I think it's a little weird because it, it, it almost makes it seem like the Star Wars saga is about droids and beings that wear helmets when <laughs> there's also aliens there's humans and you know most of the good guys don't even wear helmets <laughs> like yeah. luke that's what i was thinking the, the people who wear helmets in star wars typically are the bad guys or the anti-heroes yeah yeah maybe right. this is only the intro for uh content with protagonists that wear helmets like there <laughs> could, could be a different one <laughs> for other shows that involve uh less helmeted individuals and, and maybe if there's an episode where mando finally takes his helmet off yeah. the opening will, will skip this part like it's not really appropriate or, for this or maybe episode. they'll show each of those individuals without the helmet mm. and like yeah that, so then the droids you'll just it's see like like the circuitry on the, <laughs> below it <laughs> Oh, man, all the kids watching will be like, Mom, I don't understand <laughs> what happened to C-3PO. <laughs> so the episode starts off in a very Western-like scene where uh, there's a blue guy, a blue monster, not a monster, a humanoid, it being picked on at a bar. And then uh, Mandalorian shows up at the bar, causing these jerks to spill their drink. The jerks turn to the Mandalorian and they're like, Mando! And then speaking in their unique, their native language, you made me spill my drink. Mandalorian ignores them. And so one of them comes over, scratches his armor, and then he turns on him and the Mandalorian takes them all out, vaporizes at least one of them with his gun. Th- thoughts on this scene? This is our introduction to the character. I thought it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean- and he's there too, the blue guy. Is uh, it was a bounty? Yeah. The Mandalorian is there to take him. At this point, you don't know that yet, though, right? Right. Yeah. No, I thought it was awesome. I think it's just he doesn't take any crap. You know, if you mess with him, he's gonna mess with you right back. Yeah. Right. And, and at first, you think he's basically rescuing this blue guy. Yeah. Then immediately takes his chip out. Blue guy realizes the Mandalorian's there to take him in. When he refuses to come with him, he has that awesome line: "It's like warm or cold. Yeah, I can take you either way." <laughs> It's so, I mean, you referenced like the, the kids watching, making a joke about the 3PO with his wiring exposed before. Mm-hmm. And this, like the first scene, if you go into it thinking that it's on the Disney streaming service and is it going to be, you know, childish at all in, in any way, they basically set the tone right away that they're not afraid to get dark. I mean, that, the guy gets cut in half yeah. by the door closing <laughs> oh, <yeah>. on him. <laughs> uh, and I just thought it reminded. I mean, it's obviously super western, but the the doors opening was so similar to the like a, the saloon doors flying right. open in in a you know a Clint Eastwood or whatever. And he 
it was it was just a good great tone setter right. for everything also mm-hmm. the guy references um best car right away the the uh, facial hair person and it it's one of the things i think the the episode does really well is sort of slowly lets you in on this kind of world building stuff and if you have never heard best car before this is you're kind of like oh what's best car i wonder if i'll you know learn more about that or is it important and it's just it just does a good it was a great first yeah scene. it's pretty it is a pretty user-friendly show if you're not entrenched in star wars mythology i mainly know what's in the movies so i hear best scars kind of in one ear out the other but they'll come back to it a few times in this episode and they, they, they give you just enough so you can kind of keep up with it and you know what's important so what's best car <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's like the the stuff. That, I mean, I we're gonna. I feel like we're gonna get to it if we're if we're going down the line here. Yeah, that, that's true. That thing that he gets paid in, which is also then melted down into. Okay, the okay, yeah. But he says, "Is that real Beskar steel or Beskar armor?" Right. Uh, before you think he scratches it. There are a couple other things I'd say about the scene. Are uh, so one, we said it. It totally sets the Western style. I mean, even the way it looks. The fact that they're in a saloon, you have the bartender trying to keep the peace. Like, don't worry, I'll pour you another drink. The one thing I'll say is that uh, one of the first things you notice about this show is how good it looks, how cinematic it looks. And the one place where I feel like the seams show a little bit that it's still a TV show is anytime it's close hand-to-hand combat. Yeah. I can sort of see it. You see all those super quick cuts. Too many cuts. Yeah. It almost feels like like CW show fighting, like right. Arrow and all that. Yeah, or like Power Rangers. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely not nearly as bad as that, but that was kind of the one place in the show where I see the scenes yeah. a little bit. It's especially disappointing there because we know that the actor that plays the Mandalorian, we've seen him in Game of Thrones with using a similar weapon. That's true, a spear. Doing some amazing like fighting techniques. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, man, uh, John Favreau. I know they're shooting season two right now. If you're listening, just work on the, f- the fist fights a little bit. Yeah. That would take this from an A to an A+. Plus. <laughs> the Mandalorian takes the blue guy. He wants to bring him back to his ship and uh, collect his reward. And he has uh, this, this kind of cool-looking alien guy. It's got a sort of snout almost, which he uses to play a whistle. That brings a little speeder by, but it's being driven by a droid. Mandalorian says, no droids. Brings another one. It's kind of a speeder. It's sort of falling apart. Gets on that one. Brings him back to his ship. Blue guy and the Mandalorian are going to take off when they're attacked by a Ravenac. Giant monster that kind of comes out of the ground like a tremor. You ever seen the movie Tremors? Of course. Kevin Bacon. Classic. <laughs> and that's another moment of like, wow, this show looks really good. Fights off the... Unless anyone has anything else to say about that, it fights off the Ravenac, and then why wa- no droids? Was there an obvious reason for no droids? Uh, I think I've, I was reading a little bit about this, and we'll we'll see little flashes of the Mandalorian's history uh, as the show goes on. And you you see a flash when he's a kid and his village or town is attacked. I f- I suspect that droids were somehow involved mm. in that, and there's some like mistrust of droids. Resulting from because uh, he basically gets that guy murdered by saying I'm not murdered but killed by the Ravnak because he requests a non droid. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the guy that dropped him off person. at his ship he got he gets eaten by the Ravnak on right. his way back. Right. While they're in fight, the blue guy says he has to use the bathroom, the back tube as he calls it, and uh, clearly he's just looking for an excuse to try and escape. So. He leaves the front of the ship, goes downstairs, starts snooping around, looking at weapons. Mandalorian shows up. Boom. Puts the guy in carbonite. That guy is such a good... It's such a smart character to have like this neurotic guy when you when the Mandalorian doesn't talk at all. And he does all this exposition <laughs> because he's nervous. Where he's like... Oh, uh, I heard you guys never take off your helmets. Is that true? And oh, I, well, I have a pretty big bounty. You know, I have a lot of credits. And he just explains all this stuff about the universe, but it's it doesn't feel like exposition because it just feels like it's a nervous guy mm, that doesn't right. want to be you know killed. Even when he even when the Mandalorian puts the puck down, that shows a little hologram of the blue guy. Yeah, it's like, is that a bounty puck? <laughs> Look, all right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A- yeah. It's like when a, when you're in a video game and your character doesn't talk, and the other people have to ham fist <laughs> yeah. in all the information. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> ah, you're a man of few words, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of... Uh, so I watch uh, uh, Better Call Saul. I have a podcast about that too, Saulcast, for anyone who's uh, interested. <laughs> but I was listening to an interview with Vince Gilligan, and he talks about how hard they try to avoid any obvious exposition. And he was talking about introducing the idea that Saul and, um, what's his brother's name in that show? I forget, Chuck. How, how do you introduce that they're brothers? And he's like, well, the, the lazy way to do it is, you know, Chuck walks in and he's like, Saul, we're brothers, right? We haven't talked in what, 20 years? And it's like the really <laughs> obvious exposition. <laughs> but you're right, it's, it, they did such a good job of it here. It's, you don't even notice it because nervous character blabs a lot. So, uh, oh yeah, the other thing here is I didn't realize how available carbonite technology is. It seemed like a big deal in Empire Strikes Back when he freezes uh, Han So The movie ends with Han Solo frozen in carbonite. And here it seems like... He had like a Rolodex of pre-carbonited individuals. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if... Uh, Looking at Jeremy, is this... Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. In, in, in Empire, they do make it seem like it's a pretty tough thing to yeah. come by and he just has all these but this takes place years later post return of the jedi right. so maybe by now they struck a somebody found a mine exactly <laughs> yeah this is like where when uh, sd cards first came out you know 500 <laughs> megabyte sd card right. was like a thousand bucks now you can get a five gig one or a you can get like a terabyte one for a hundred bucks yeah han was on like the zip disc of uh <laughs> <laughs> Mandalorian goes back to town and uh, meets up with Carl Weathers, who played Apollo Creed, which will be relevant later in the episode, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Mandalorian walks in to, uh, to meet with Carl Weathers, who asks him, did you catch them all? So it's probably all the carbonated uh, bounty people he was going after. And then the, uh, Carl Weathers tries to, play him, tries to pay him with basically imperial money. Mandalorian turns it down, saying the Empire is gone. This money is basically useless to me. So instead, he gives him calamari flan, but can only pay him half. <laughs> Which it's so hard to hear that in a, in a post-Rick and Morty world, where on that show, half of it is, is making fun of these sci-fi world, words. But when they go to a bar in another dimension, it's like, do you have any uh, flim flams? Or... <laughs> it's like an easily picture Rick. Be like, Emily, uh, calamari flan. <laughs> <laughs> right, or not pick a picture like calamari, the seafood, and flan, the dessert. <laughs> yeah. It did look like mini flans a little bit. It did. They looked it, like something you could eat. They looked gelatinous. Carl Weathers, by the way, he's that's hey, John Favreau. That's who you can ask how to choreograph a fist fight. I would, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's not to do your job for you, John, but. Yeah. <laughs> Who I'm sure is listening. I'm sure he's very upset with us right now. Did you hear what they said about me on one take? <laughs> so the Mandalorian wants more work from Carl Weathers, but he wants he wants some big money. He doesn't have any really good offers. And Carl Weathers tells him about a, a specific deal that's pretty mysterious. Doesn't give him a lot of information about it. <laughs> he just goes, well, there is this one job. Right. Which is <laughs> such a line that if I didn't love Star Wars, I feel like I would probably hate, but I think it works so well in this context or maybe i don't i don't know maybe i'm a fanboy yeah <laughs> I don't know, how did you feel about it alone i liked it i mean for me i'm watching this show just to enjoy it. I'm, i wasn't looking for anything super sophisticated in this show mm -hmm. and if if we do end up getting that great but i'm just enjoying the ride yeah so to me that line i thought it fit the the world yeah yeah Agreed. I mean, I there's a few cliches you'll see throughout the episode, but... Yeah. No, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he takes a job, and then he goes to see... It's kind of crazy. It, it feels like they, they got these big actors, and, and he immediately goes from Carl Weathers, meets up with Werner Herzog, who uh, is surrounded by, by stormtroopers who look kind of, kind of dirtied. And I guess these are post-war leftover stormtroopers empire's been taken down and uh werner says uh about the mandalorian he says he said you were the best in the parsec parsec another reference right what was the line from uh, han solo it's the uh 
Oh God! He was able to he, the, the Millennium Falcon won the, the race in like seven parsecs or something. Yeah, but it's the whole thing where like is parsec a distance or it's a unit of time? But then they do it in in, uh, uh, in, in the solo, solo movie. movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, basically, so he meets he meets Werner surrounded by stormtroopers. A doctor walks in like a fool. It's a tense situation. He's like, "Hey, what's up, guys?" Everyone takes their guns out. <laughs> Werner tells the Mandalorian to lower his blaster. Mandalorian says, tell them to lower theirs first. That may be one of the best lines. Stormtrooper says, we got you four to one. What does the Mandalorian say? I like those odds. I was going to let Jeremy say it. Because <laughs> oh, we were, I was going to let Gil say it. We, we were talking both. about it earlier. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> he told me he loved that line. So I was I wondering why him do it. You both had these goofy grins on, <laughs> yeah. just like nodding at me. That's, that's, that's why I was. I was the looking show at Jeremy. instills a goofy grin in you. I think, in, yeah. in a fun, in an enjoyable way. Yeah, I think he's definitely. This character is awesome. Like he just doesn't. My, my dad. I don't think he's watched this yet, but he would love this show because he always complains when a character just keeps talking. He's like, "Stop talking! Just shoot! <laughs> do what you need to do." Again, very like Clint Eastwood style, like just of one thing and I mean they don't fight after that but doesn't talk a lot you know he could have known you know he, he could have taken out all those yes. stormtroopers 100% so uh, Werner basically can't give him a lot of information can't even give him a puck you know one of those pucks that shows you an image of whoever you're going after for the bounty he can only give him a fob last known position and he can tell him that the asset is 50 years old and uh, he gives him a one best car this kind of metallic square. So you get the impression this is a pretty valuable piece of uh, uh, currency. And he tells him he gets a lot more if he brings the asset back. And he says that he understands things get complicated, so alive is the preference. But if you bring him back with proof that you killed this asset, that works too. The doctor wasn't happy about that. The yeah. doctor didn't want him dead. He wanted him alive. Right, which gives you the impression... At least when I watched it, I, it gave me the impression this is somebody that he'd want to study or like dissect or something. Um, there is one little morsel of information they give us where uh, Werner Herzog says, and I'll try and do my, my Werner Herzog impression. Okay. The best car belongs back into the hands of a Mandalorian. It is good to restore the natural order of things after a period of such disarray. Don't you agree? That was really good. Thank you. I remember when they, because that line's in the trailer too, and I remember thinking he was going to say whatever his name was right after that line. But then oh, he did because yeah. it sounded like it ended on a comma and hit the next thing was going to be like, don't you agree, you know, Boba Fett or whatever. Right. <laughs> uh, but that didn't happen. But yeah, the line is great. It does another like, su not subtle, but subtle, I guess, for the kind of show that this is mm -hmm. world building thing where you get another little bit of information about Beskar that you oh like, oh, it must be something that has some significance to the Mandalorian or Mandalorians and right you know this is where they, they keep bringing up the best car like, is that real best car steal ah it's good to give this best car back to try and dumb it down a little bit but for some people it wasn't quite enough <laughs> well I, I still have the second episode fresh from my head I forgot all about the best car <laughs> the Mandalorian goes back to uh, <laughs> what looks like basically a Mandalorian hideout he goes down there you see a bunch of kids running around he meets uh, a lady Mandalorian who has kind of... <laughs> <laughs> it's tough with this show. There's a lot of characters that don't have names. <laughs> it's like you got the Mandalorian, the spiky helmet Mandalorian. The, so this... You call her the furry Mandalorian. She had like that fur on. Okay, we can call her that too. <laughs> she had kind of... She looked more like... He, he looks very sci-fi. She looked like a mix of sci-fi and sort of traditional. She had like an animal fur. Her helmet was spiky. Yeah, right. And I mean, she's like hitting a, you know, like an Iron Man, John Favreau, uh, yeah. <laughs> hitting a, you know, a thing, like a, a, a like a. a hold on, I wrote this word uh, down, uh, but I couldn't remember. It was a smith, a smith. Well, she's like a smith. smith. Yeah, yeah. Is that there's a word for that though? It's like a something smith, blacksmith, a blacksmith, a yeah. blacksmith. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's she's called the armorer, right? That's the. That's right. Yeah. If yeah. you turn your uh, closed caption on, it refers to her as the armorer. 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 <laughs> uh, the Mandalorian hands some best car, his best car over to uh, the furry Mandalorian. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, This was gathered in the Great Purge. 
It is good it is, it is back with the tribe. A pauldron would be in order. Has your signet been revealed? Been revealed? What does the Mandalorian say? No. Not yet. <laughs> then she, uh, she says, soon. Melts down the best car, turns it into a shoulder plate, and then sticks it on his shoulder. So I'm assuming there, uh, the signet, if it had been revealed, it would have been engraved onto the shoulder pad. Mm. Isn't that interesting, though? Revealed almost as though it's some magical revelation that'll come. Right. So, so I don't know if he's going to like gradually get more parts on his armor or something, but when I saw that, I was like, well, that's like Mega Man X, when you just <laughs> gradually get more parts and you just look cooler every yeah. time. Depending on which boss you defeat, yeah. you get a... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just waiting to see him just keep looking cooler and cooler. Yeah, do you think that means it's private and it's not revealed because it's not public or it's not revealed because it hasn't been, you know, determined? That's kind of how I read it. And I don't know if it was meant to be spiritual or revealed as in you have some significant experience and then you decide what your signet right. is going to be. That's kind of how I read it. Mandalorian doesn't strike me as very a very spiritual person. Even though he does refer to his religion later. Mm. But it was more of a badass, like, weapons are my religion. Mm. Right. And the... Oh, unless you think he was being serious. So the armor is like a priest because weapons are his religion. Yeah, I don't know. So I, I read it as kind of uh, flippant. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll see. They go on, so she melts the best card down, gives him a new shoulder plate. So upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> and then she says, this is extremely generous. The excess will sponsor many foundlings. This is my other favorite line. Then the Mandalorian says, That's good. I was once a foundling. And she says, I know. (laughs) (laughs) It just feels like it's something he just brings up all the time. Like, you know, I was a foundling once. (laughs) I know. That's what this whole thing's about. (laughs) So how does she know that? But she doesn't know if his signet has been revealed yet, right? Like, it seems like you would maybe know both of those things. Or if he didn't know one, you wouldn't. I don't know. If he was a man of more words, he probably would have made that point. Mm. Like behind the helmet, he was probably muttering to himself, like, well, he didn't even know about my signets. <laughs> found me. It's like, what'd you say? <laughs> Nothing. That's fine. <laughs> uh, after he says that, we get a slow zoom on the Mandalorian's helmet, and then some flashbacks play across the screen. What I mentioned earlier, where you see him being carried, presumably by his mother as a child, while all hell is breaking loose around them. Sort of seems like their village is under attack. She throws him into a hideout. Kind of uh, Ray style. Force Awakens. And uh, cut back as she puts the shoulder plate on. And there's some kind of triumphant music. And then a cool transition to, uh, to a ship. Star Wars is always good at the transitions between scenes, right? Like a ship will appear and then a circle will kind of grow out of it and reveal the next scene. <laughs> I don't know if I, I would say yeah i mean they're kind of corny right like i don't know but yeah it's a it's a definitely star wars right thing you know it does sometimes i remember watching the prequels in theaters and thinking it felt a little like someone who had just discovered what's uh <laughs> what's the mac or the apple version of like windows movie maker right yeah like iMovie. iMovie. Yeah. iMovie and it's like star wipe over here right do another star right. wipe the over Simpsons, here uh, <laughs> Star Wipe. You remember that from The Simpsons? The Star Wipe thing? Kind of. Oh, I do remember that, yeah. Star Wipe? Yeah. And that was my George Lucas impression. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple things uh, from that scene. Uh, so she makes the comment about how the excess of melting down the, the best car will help many foundlings. So up to this point in the episode, sort of feels like Mandalorian's badass Clint Eastwood type out for himself. Here, I read this scene as part of what he's doing is He's going out there trying to get money to bring it back to help the Mandalorian people. I don't know if that was your read on the show. Read yeah. Your read on the scene as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. Awesome. So it seems like he's uh, you know, a little bit more anti-hero, but maybe leaning a little bit more towards hero uh, than you originally think when he, in cold blood, kills a bunch of guys at the bar earlier. From there, Mandalorian goes to the planet where the asset is located. Immediately gets attacked by a couple Blorgs, which are... I don't know. How would you describe a Blorg? That sounds maybe even more like a Rick and Morty thing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 then he gets saved by... It's, it's, see, the show doles it out slowly, so it'll be a few minutes between each use of one of these <laughs> like sci-fi words. Yeah. 
But when you lay it all out there, it's like he grabs his uh, grabs his best car, gets attacked by a couple Blorgs, but he gets saved by an Ugnot. So, <laughs> so the Ugnot shows up and saves him, and then says, "You are a bounty hunter. I will help you. I have spoken." <laughs> which is the best. I love the the "I have spoken" thing, right? Which which I took to mean basically, you're not going to change my mind. This is my like th- that's it. I've spoken. Yeah, I like it. It's awesome. You feel even if you do, are not familiar with like Ugnot anything, you have an immediate understanding of like, oh, this is who this character is. This is what's going on. Hey, so have we seen Ugnots? Yeah, they're in. Uh, they're in. I think in Cloud City in, in Empire Strikes Back. Oh, so we, even we from, the, from the original trilogy, yeah, mm-hmm. they were around. Okay, oh yeah. Did we hear them talk much? Like the "I have spoken" thing is that an invention that's for this? New. Show? Yeah, that's new for this. Gotcha. I, be- I believe. I don't know. We'll find yeah. out in the corrections, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Ugnot explains that many have showed up here in search of this asset, and many have failed. He explains that they're going to have to ride a blurg to get uh, to get to the asset. <laughs> The uh, Mandalorian keeps trying to get on the blurg. He keeps falling off. Gets frustrated. He's like, can't you just give me a speeder or something? And the Ugnot, he chides him. He says, you are a Mandalorian. Your ancestors rode the great Mythosaur. Surely you can ride this young fowl. <laughs> and then uh, Mandalorian stands up. Gets uh, motivated. Rides the blurg. Cut to them riding a couple blurgs. And the Rocky theme starts playing. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I love the score of this show. And there is one recurring theme that sounds very Rocky-like. Yeah. Which was the connection I was making before with uh, Carl Carl Weathers Weathers. showing up. It didn't really seem as a quick aside, or if they did, they skipped it. Riding the Blurg did not seem that necessary to get to where they end up. He was like, "You gotta take the Blurg." It did. It did not look like he had to take the Blurg. No. <laughs> Maybe they skip. Maybe that's a deleted scene. I don't know. Well, we but, see. Yeah, yeah, a, they like jump over a couple of rocks. <laughs> the, the show is really short, right? This episode is forty minutes. The next one is just around thirty, and it's because this is all the deleted stuff they took out. All the all right, the stuff yeah. we're talking about, where he's like, "Do I really need to ride a Blurg? This seems unnecessary." That's the stuff they cut out. <laughs> <laughs> I love, uh, just real quick on the Ugnot too, like the way that his lips don't really match the way that he's saying, which makes it look like a, a puppet from the original trilogy, kind of, to me. Where, like he looks very realistic, way more realistic than he did before, but still the you know mouth moving doesn't sync up in the way that you would think it would for a human. And I love that they kind of had this, you know, let's modernize it, but also not at the same time. Make mm-hmm. it seem like that's just the way their lips move, right? I don't know. That was. I feel like like I like when they do things like that. Yeah, th- this show feels like a really good blend of the heavy CG stuff, but still moments like that where it's clearly a practical effect. Yeah, yeah. Or they're blending them in, in some way where it's not. It doesn't just make the original stuff look like it was a horrific mistake and they couldn't get it to look like what they right. wanted. Right. Uh, the the one thing that I, I know I poked at a little bit, and I don't think I think Alon, you didn't really agree with me on this. It felt a little cheesy to me that they made it such a big deal that he was able to get back on the blurg after getting that little motivational speech from the Ugnot. The music sort of swells, and I was kind of like, all right, I guess. Yeah, I mean, maybe I have to rewatch it. When I when I saw, it, I didn't remember it feeling like they were trying to make it as big a deal. As you're making it sound now, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe if I rewatch it, I'll agree with you. To me, it just seemed like just uh, an informational aspect of his history they were trying to point out to you. Right. I, I, it didn't seem like they were trying to make it super dramatic. Yeah. But like I said, I only watched it once. You watched it twice. Maybe <laughs> I would agree with you if I watch it again. All right. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be picky because. Since everyone loved this show so much, I was like, I got to find something to, to poke at. I mean, it, w- it was like a 30-second, it's impossible, I can't do it. Yes, you can. Okay, I can. Yeah. Like it, was, it, was, you know, it was a very quick, a rushed Rocky montage. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. So I, I get some validation there. Uh, I'm curious at this point in the episode, did you have any, any thoughts of what the asset could be? Were you, did you have any theories at this point? I I had no I, I had no clue. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, no idea. No, I had no idea. I mean, they they 
red herring you so hard with the 50 year old thing right yeah. right that i yeah i mean, definitely I, was not yeah i mean obviously I, I knew it couldn't just be a normal job i yeah. knew it was it was probably gonna be something that would tell you like that would be meaningful to the rest of the season mm-hmm. uh, but i had no idea what it would be the, the thing i kept for some reason and i have no idea if this is a really stupid theory or not but i thought it might be boba fett <laughs> and then when he shows up to the encampment, you kind of see this big hole in the ground. And I was like, wait, is this where he got fed to the... Oh, <laughs> but then Sarlacc I was like, pit, yeah. if he's been in the Sarlacc pit for just years waiting for a bounty hunter, which <laughs> it didn't really add up. So at that right. point, I was well, like, Well, it's supposed no to take you a really long time to be digested by the Sarlacc pit. So there could be... A, I don't think it would have been... I think people would have been upset by the yeah. logic of that, but <laughs> maybe. Not, definitely I mean, definitely not. not definitely yeah. not, because I was wrong. Well, I, yeah, but I mean, it could have, you know. Gotcha, gotcha. Or the Mandalorian is Boba Fett still. You know, we don't know. Who that's knows? a theory that's out there. Even though in an interview recently, Pedro Pascal just offhand mentioned the real name. Really? Of his character. No spoilers, please. Yeah. I did not see it. Anyway. <laughs> it, was an, <laughs> it was an official interview released from Disney Plus, though, so it didn't seem like... So the name was, was Boba Fett. I'm not gonna say anything. <laughs> yeah, but what if it, yeah, but it also could be like a uh, uh, like Robin at the end of Dark Knight Rises type thing, where we yeah. say it's one name and then somebody goes, "Why don't you go by your middle name?" <laughs> oh, Boba Fett. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when he gets there, an IG-11 robot droid is already there. This is a droid that's programmed. Uh, he's part of the guild, programmed for bounty hunting. And uh, he causes all kinds of trouble because he just starts, he goes in guns blazing basically <laughs> as soon as the people at this encampment refuse to give up the asset. And then uh, Mandalorian goes down, uh, makes a quick deal with IG-11 to work together. Uh, anytime it seems like they're they're stuck, <laughs> IG-11's like, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to self-destruct. And he's like, yeah. don't self-destruct. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, eventually, they uh, a laser cannon shows up. Mandalorian's able to take take out the guy manning that, takes over the laser cannon, turns it against the bad guys, uses it to blast open the door containing uh, the asset, and then they go in. But before we get to uh, the asset itself, uh, thoughts on this scene? Oh, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just really good action and... I love how like it was like three times the bounty droid was like self destruct commencing. <laughs> like no, stop, <laughs> cover me. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. It was a good like. I mean, we'd seen him do the fist fight in the beginning. You haven't really seen him do too much, you know, blaster stuff. Uh, and this was a good reminder of like, yeah. oh, all right, this guy is really. He's not just some guy that learned to ride a blurg ten minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> he can do a lot of blaster stuff too. Also had the the grappling hook. I think he used to kind of pull the gun. Yeah. So we learned some more of his abilities here. Yeah. Awesome scene. Uh, IG Eleven was hilarious. Yeah. Uh, again, just to put on my my critic hat. One thing I'll poke at. It's a little cheesy when they're like, "How are we gonna get through this door?" And then uh, the Mandalorian and the robots slowly turn their heads and look at the laser cannon. <laughs> cut to the door being you blown You thinking down. what I'm thinking? Like that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> they get in. You see a little pod, like a little sphere, basically. Open it up. Baby Yoda. Big reveal. <laughs> Adorable. So were all those people protecting the baby Yoda species thing? Were they gonna? What were they gonna do with it? I mean, that was I, one know. of my big questions in the scene. Who were the people I mean, at the encampment? They seemed like bad guys. I mean, but what right? if they were protecting? Like, what if we eventually learned they were protecting him, and then <laughs> Mandalorian just murders all these? people? I mean, I guess he's murdered a lot of people. That's and he true. Continues yeah. to do it. In the yeah, next the one thing too, we so. missed was baby Yoda's mother, like Yaddle, probably the only <laughs> <laughs> is chasing after him. My baby, what are right. you doing? Right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know who they were. They definitely had a feeling of uh, they're bad guys, but we don't know who they are, as far as I know, or what they were doing with Baby Yoda. Maybe they were doing experiments on him. You know, who knows? Uh, IG-11 takes out his gun to shoot yeah. the Baby Yoda. Cut to, uh, you hear the blast, but then you see IG-11 fall to the ground. Mandalorian shot him in the head to save the baby. 
And then a very cute scene where uh, the man- Mando <laughs> yeah. sticks his finger yeah. out and Baby Yoda reaches for it. E.T. That's right. <laughs> Cut right before uh, Baby Yoda grabs his finger. I-, I love the way they introduce certain characters that you think are going to be more impactful. Like they might have a main role in the rest of the story here, but then they just dispose of them. Like first you got the blue guy at the beginning, and then uh, he's carbonated. They got this droid. Like I could see the droid and the Mandalorian be like partners, and then bang, droid's dead. Right. So I, I hope he comes back in some way, though. Yeah, or another he, one. Yeah, because yeah. you get the feeling this is not. There's many of these droids running around. Yeah. Right. Like pesky. Like oh crap, is it a an IG 11s <laughs> on the case too? I got to deal with. <laughs> Voiced by Taika Waititi, by the way. Mm. Uh, who uh, Jojo Rabbit? We were talking about earlier. Yeah. He directed that and plays Hitler in that movie. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Imaginary Hitler. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, and by the way, you mentioned ET. It's a uh, canon in the Star Wars universe that ET's species of aliens right. exist in this galaxy because they're in the Senate. That's right, in the prequels. That's <laughs> yeah. right. Uh, any theories? So at the, at this point, I mean, I guess we've already seen Episode Two, so maybe we can save uh, if you have any Baby Yoda theories um, for uh, once we get into Episode Two. But I guess just your reaction when you see. Baby Yoda on screen. What's your what's your immediate reaction? Uh, I gotta be honest. I, at first, I would like I don't know. I felt weird about it. It felt like Yoda's, and I know there's Yaddle too, but it felt like mm-hmm. Yoda's supposed to be the only Yoda. And I don't know. I'm I'm way more on board with it now that I have thought about it for longer than I was at first. But I did like in my gut. My very first thought was like, oh no, yeah. But but I like it now. But right, kind of ruining the, the the scarcity of or the specialness of Yoda, where I mean, for those of you unfamiliar with Jeremy, just alluded to that we see Yoda, we don't see anyone else of his species, we don't even know what his species is called. The only other example was a, a female Yoda we saw named uh, Yaddle in one of the movies. Which movie? One of the prequels, I think right? It's in Episode Two. She's on like the the Jedi Council also, yeah. oh. and she just looks like. Yoda with a ponytail kind of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, what I thought was funny is that baby Yoda already has gray hair. <laughs> right. Well, he is, he's 50 years old. And so they comment on that where the Mandalorian says, uh, you know, I thought he was supposed to be 50. And the robot says, you know, some, uh, some species age differently. <laughs> and they don't be such a, don't be so judgmental. Not everybody's, you know, like you humans. If the Mandalorian is even human, I don't know. Right. Uh, so then we cut. That's the end of the episode. And one really cool thing I thought they did is over the end credits, they have what I assume is a concept art or basically paintings almost of scenes from the episode, which to me gave it almost like a mythic, like legendary feel of like this is important. These are important stories, and here's the memories of them. Yeah, I thought it's yeah. really cool. And that, you know, now we know having seen two of them that they continue to do that. And I think I do think it's really cool. Uh, technique does yeah. make it feel a lot bigger yeah like some cave wall paintings or something yeah exactly like uh like the end credits of wally for example also disney so so it's relevant mm. <laughs> <laughs> all right well, let's jump right into episode two we see the mandalorian walking with the floating baby yoda next to him so that pod apparently has the ability to to basically float so it floats next to him uh, and we see a close-up of the of the baby. He's got very expressive ears. <laughs> kind of uses them to express his emotions, it feels like. Sort of like a dog wagging its tail. Uh, they get attacked by some uh, some people who we see have one of those fobs. Those tracking mm-hmm. fobs. So it looks like they're going after the asset. Mandalorian takes him out. Uh, vaporizes at least one of them. And he gets uh, sliced on his arm. And one cool thing we see... Right before the fight starts, the Mandalorian is able to kind of swipe his hand, which sends the pod like flying away yeah. and out of harm's way. But one question I had about that is, how do you think he's able to do that? Well, I thought he like pressed something right before he did it. So he has some sort of controller. Right. So that's my question. Yeah. When he found the pod, is it like had a little controller next to it? Maybe he attached something to it that gave it the ability. Oh, he had a floaty thing. Which he attached to the pod. 
Or maybe Yoda's been using the Force to control it the whole that time. That is what I thought before <laughs> he did such an over-the-top like yeah. hand gesture to move it, which I don't even know if I... Maybe I didn't catch it the first time, but he does yeah. it a couple other times he later does, in yeah. the episode. And at that point, I was like, oh, it's not the not the Force. Well, one funny <laughs> idea I had is I wonder if Baby Yoda sees him doing that, and he's like, oh, wow, he's got the Force too. <laughs> 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 Uh, this again is um, I thought not a bad fight scene but like once again anytime it's the close hand to hand combat you see all those cuts and I don't love it but I didn't hate it I thought it was alright Nighttime, Mandalorian sitting there uh, healing himself he has this little device that it looks like it sends a little electric thing that he's kind of going over his cut with it mm-hmm. but while he's doing that baby Yoda keeps getting out of his pod <laughs> walking over and reaching up to the cut and starts to kind of close his eyes, and then Mando picks him up and puts him back in his pod. <laughs> so I think the, uh, I mean, the way I read that is Yoda's trying to heal him. Mm-hmm. Do we do we have any examples in Star Wars canon of someone using the Force to heal? Uh, I mean, there must be. I, the first thing that jumps at me is the Episode Three scene when Palpatine is talking to Anakin about being able to save people. You know, mm-hmm. when they go to that weird opera with the giant bubbles. Right, right. You know, the, the, Actually, I have no idea what you're talking about. The bubbles. I don't remember Yeah, that. they're like watching these big bubbles. It's when he talks about Darth Plagueis. And have you mm-hmm. ever heard the story of... No. Yeah. No. Darth, Darth Plagueis. Fill us in. Oh, gosh. This is gonna go, I'm not going to know enough to fill in all the things. But they go watch, like, Palpatine has Anakin there at the, at the opera. And he's basically trying to, you know, seduce him to the dark side. And mm-hmm. he is tells him the story of Darth Plagueis the Wise and blah, blah, blah. And he alludes to how the, you know, eventually you can use the Force to prevent the ones that you love from from dying. and But he, uh, not from a Jedi, that, that whole, uh, <laughs> you know, that whole bit. So that's, right. that's definitely been, I'm sure there's a better example that I'm just whiffing on right now. But I think, you know, yeah. generally the, the Force can do a lot of weird stuff. Yeah, yeah, and it does stuff we've never even even in. Uh, I mean, that was part of the controversy with Last Jedi, Leia using the Force to basically float to her ship. People right. are like, the Force can't do that. Yeah, but I mean, I th- if you watch all of the movies, there there's constantly some kind of a new thing that they didn't right. specifically spell out what the Force can and can't do before. Right. You know, it lets a tiny kid be able to control a crazy fast race car thing. Mm-hmm. What is what is it doing there? He can think fat. Like it could probably you could envision a world where it could do everything. I think to me, right, right. Yeah. So it looks like Baby Yoda's got a lot of midichlorians running through his veins, right? Midichlorians. That was uh, from Episode One, the biological explanation for the Force. The more midichlorians you have in your blood, the more access you have to the Force. Just wanted to prove that I know a thing or two about Star Wars as well. <laughs> in the same way that so many people don't like the midichlorian stuff because it starts to add this like specificity to a mysterious and vague thing. Those are like my that was my initial worry of the of the Yoda right. baby Yoda reveal. Like, oh now are we gonna learn too much about Yoda, pull back the curtain too far and the right. details are way less interesting than a you know, being able to do a podcast speculating about things, for example. Right. <laughs> that was my worry about the carbonite. <laughs> Too much carbonite. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh no, I'm worried about the carbonite, and then a Yoda shows up. Blow, blow your brain up. <laughs> well, you know, carbonite, I could picture it actually being something rare, and he just, on some mission, stole a bunch. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. You know, we'll get an episode about that. Yeah. I'm running low on carbonite. <laughs> Gonna have to go to the Flim Flam planet and get more. <laughs> So then they're walking in the desert with uh, Baby Yoda. Sees uh, Then he sees a bunch of Jawas stripping his ship for parts. Vaporizes a few of them. And uh, th- th- this is one thing in this show, which I, they're, they're killing people. It's left and right, oh which my I find gosh. interesting. <laughs> yeah, right in front of the baby 50-year-old Yoda. Too. Yeah. Like They make a point where it's like some kind of like, Leon the professional type thing or something where he has the gun up looks at the kid and he's like nah, I'm gonna do it anyway yeah. he just murders yeah, Jawas even the Jawas don't seem to care that much yeah that was crazy too <laughs> that was my biggest issue I think with this episode I know we're going ahead now mm-hmm. a little bit but like they they basically kind of laugh it off yeah more or less yeah they're almost like I mean like sophisticated insects where like 
Ants don't really care if you kill a few of them. In fact, part of their strategy is to let a few of them die. You right. Know? It's funny you say that, actually, because I was reading up on Jawas. So I was wondering, what do they look like under those ropes? And in Star Wars canon, it's actually a mysterious thing that people talk about. There's a theory that under the robes, they kind of are rodent-like. So they might be vermin. Hmm. In which case, maybe not the biggest deal that a few Aren't of them... like gerbils types of... No, those aren't rodent. I'm trying to think of a cute rodent. Hamster? Hamster. I mean, m- mice are cute. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So they might be cute. All right, they might be cute. Glowy red eyes. I mean, they're they're kind of cute as is, like a yeah, little that's like, true. Oh, teeny, it's yeah. a you know. Suka. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like cute, like they're like frat boys uh, <laughs> chanting this. <laughs> uh, that would be great, actually. For this is what we got to do for the finale: Mandalorian watch party. Let's make like a jungle juice in a big <laughs> egg, egg make it yellow. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, so the Jawas have this big. I don't know how you would describe this thing. It's like a. It's like a big boat. Uh, they called it a fortress. Something moving like a fortress. Crawl, it's a, fortress. I think it's called a crawler, right? Or a crawler. Has, I think it has. Yeah, sand crawler, maybe. I Something like that. I mean, it was a big structure, like a big building almost on wheels, and moved slowly through the desert. The Mandalorian tries to jump on the ship. Wants to climb up, get his parts back. As he tries climbing up, the Jawas keep dropping garbage on him. <laughs> Leaves Baby Yoda, by the way, significantly far away yeah. when he does this. That was what I was thinking the whole... Until yeah, it, you know, me too. That, I was like, wow, this thing is moving probably pretty fast. Yeah. And he has left this baby very far. That's right. But but to, to very quickly, the camera turns and you see Baby Yoda, zo- baby Yoda zooming along <laughs> in his uh, pod, following this whole thing. Uh, as uh, the Mandalorian gets up to the top of the structure, they all use their uh, shockers or whatever, tasers, basically. They shock him, and then he falls. Uh... Oh, no, I skipped a part, actually, right? He uses his grappling hook yeah. to get onto the gun, and then they knock the gun off the structure, so he falls. Cut to yeah. the top of the, the building thing. Mandalorian's up there. That was weird. That, I don't know how he got up there. If he was a little closer to the top, it would have made more sense. But where he was, I don't know how the hell he got up there. Right, the geography of it didn't really make sense. Yeah. Because yeah. he's falling like three seconds later. Surprise, he made it up to the top when yeah. you weren't looking. Maybe he had a second grappling hook that, that he used as soon as he fell yeah. to get to the... We edge. haven't seen evidence of a second grappling hook That's yet. Right. One, one wrist is a flamethrower and the other is a grappling <laughs> hook. true. From what and I've seen. <laughs> one thing I actually like is the grappling hook. It's not like a cheap grappling hook like Batman where you yeah. shoot it and it pulls you up like Spider-Man. He still has to climb yeah, even, like even after yeah. he's hooked onto the thing. Yeah. Like... like uh, Adam West Batman. Yeah. That was That's what right. I thought of when he's climbing sideways up there. Yeah. Like it looks yeah. like the opening. <laughs> so then he gets to the top. They use their big tasers and he falls to the ground. That looked painful. It did. I mean, yeah. It sounded painful. Yeah. He fell far. Mm-hmm. It's a good thing he had Beskar Steel. Yeah. Right? That's our, that's our sponsor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Speaking of falling and down. And it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> Beskar.com slash podcast. Promo code. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he wakes up, goes back to his ship, and sees that it's all uh, it's all messed up. The wires are sticking out everywhere. There's holes where there shouldn't be holes. <laughs> Tries turning it on, and it doesn't work. So he goes for a little walk. It's a good walking montage here. And he finds the Ugnot. It's nighttime by the time he arrives... And uh, the Ugnot finally gets to see what the asset was that people keep dying trying to get. And he says, this is one of Alun's favorite lines. <laughs> the Ugnot says, this is what all the, all the, all the fuss. fuss. This was what was causing all the fuss. Yeah. <laughs> Mandalorian says, I think it's a child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you think it's a child? <laughs> I know it's a child. <laughs> so he's, just, he's just communicating no information yeah. by saying that. <laughs> uh, so the Ugna explains that to get your parts back, you can't go in there and fight. Right? He's not going to be able to do that. He already tried that. But with Jawas, you can trade. So we have to go trade with them. And Baby Yoda eats a little frog. <laughs> yeah, I, You thought that was disgusting. I thought it was hilarious. Jeremy? 
Uh, I it was another thing that made me worried about like the tone of the show for a second. But then I remember Star Wars always does you know silly stuff like that. Right. Oh. What? <laughs> we forgot in episode one. I forgot to mention the the salacious crumb guy, like on the spit oh, roast yeah. outside. Of the, that doesn't oh, yeah. matter. Right? But that was I don't know. Maybe. Those were the, those were like little creatures that hung out with Jabba the Hutt. Yeah, right? yeah. Salacious felt- B. Crumb was like the the one that you he was like you know my, my one of my favorite characters as a kid because I thought really? it was so, <laughs> such a funny name and it's a dumb. Why does this little character have a name and a story and stuff? Yeah. I felt bad for the little guy in the cage just watching his buddy getting oh, roasted. Yeah. 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 It really is like this. That was one of the things with this show is nobody, so many people are dying and just seems like no one really cares. Yeah. Like he didn't have, when they were picking on the blue guy in episode one, it was like a bar brawl. You don't have to kill him. He killed every person. (laughs) (laughs) Like you punch him in the face, they get knocked out, you know? (laughs) If I I know anything about Westerns, if you hit him over the head with a bottle, (laughs) that gets the job done. You don't have to slice him in half. (laughs) Anyway, sorry. Yeah, Baby Yoda eats the thing. Baby Yoda eats the thing. <laughs> Fine with it. Frog. Uh, Rocky Frog. music comes back. <laughs> um, we see them riding through the rain on their blurgs for about three seconds. <laughs> then it's uh, sunny again. Then it's sunny again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they get to the Jawas, hang out. The Ugnaught tells the Mandalorian that he's going to have to put his weapons away. Mandalorian says, Weapons. I'm a Mandalorian. Weapons are part of my religion. So there's the religion thing we yeah, talked about yeah, earlier. <laughs> um, but then he says, fine, I'll put him away. The Jawas, in exchange for his ship parts, they want the best car armor. Armor. Ugnaught basically explains to them, you can't, he's in a Mandalorian, he's not going to give you the best car. It's got to be something else. And they turn to him and they say, uh, the egg. If he can go get the egg, then they'll give him his parts back. And, then, and that's where they all start chanting, right? Suka. Suka, suka. When you hear that they want the egg, what's your reaction to that? I mean, like, my, my reaction was this is a side quest. Like, very clearly. Right, yeah, right, right. Is yeah. At first, I was like, maybe they're talking about the, the thing that Yoda was in. Because it is kind of egg-shaped. Well, he already, they already tried that's to right, get that. Yeah. And then Mandalorian yells, get away from that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> All right, well, he goes to get the egg. They drop him off at a, at a cave, and uh, Mando leaves Baby Yoda outside, goes into the cave, you hear some blasting, or it's one of those classic things where he looks at the ground, and you're like, wait a minute, that's not the ground, Yeah, the eye opens up. Yeah, like the Hank Azaria Godzilla, that's what I think <laughs> of with that bit, when the eye opens. That's right, the classic, the beloved classic yes. Godzilla remake. A reboot? I don't know what you'd call that. I don't know. I feel like that was that was a reboot, but it was before the word reboot was thrown around as, right. as often as it is today. They probably called it a reimagining. Mm. But it's been brought into original Godzilla canon because a few years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, there was a big, like, the Avengers of Godzilla where every iteration of Godzilla showed up and in one scene, original Godzilla, like, wipes the floor with uh, American reboot Godzilla really yeah huh enter the the enter the spider verse of, <laughs> of Godzilla. Godzilla's <laughs> uh, so he gets thrown out of the cave and you can immediately tell like this is not good news his armor's all messed up uh, and there's a fight where the the monster is basically like a giant rhino is what it looks like and it is just destroying the Mandalorian and this is where you see him again as the rhino goes after Baby Yoda, swipes his hand, and sends Yoda like flying, <laughs> up, flying away just in time. Tries the flamethrower, doesn't help. Tries the grappling hook, you know, doesn't help. Uh, at one point, he gets hit so hard, there's this kind of weird slowdown effect. And uh, you can tell he's messed up. He gets up. Uh, tries to kind of shake it off, takes out his knife, but you can tell he's kind of given up at this yeah. point. This is like a last stand type situation. But at the last second, Baby Yoda raises his hand and uh, uses the force, raises the monster like a foot off the ground, just enough so he can't really move. After the Mandalorian collects himself, Baby Yoda is like, okay, I can't do this anymore, falls asleep. Monster hits the ground. Mando sticks a knife in him, and it dies. 
basically immediately. So thoughts, thoughts in the scene alone. I saw a plethora of emotions <laughs> as I yeah. was describing that. I, you know, overall, I, I liked the scene. I thought there were some odd moments. Like, for instance, he just kept getting hit way too easily. Like, it looked like he was just letting it happen. Like, I understand he was already in some pain. He took that fall earlier. He got knocked out of the cave. But every time, like, he just stood there and took it from the rhino. And then when he finally just gives up and just holds a knife, like, I just felt like he was accepting his fate too easily. Um, and then when he goes and stabs the rhino, rhino I didn't understand why it, just, it basically just died instantly. Yeah. <laughs> unless there was some effect from the force as well. But it looked like the force was only being used to lift him. So, yeah. I don't know. But then, almost done. But then it was weird because after he stabbed him and he like fell and looked dead... When he pushed the knife in further, <laughs> it made another noise. Yeah. So it's probably just gas escaping. Yeah, maybe. So it also the knife looked like it was like it was barely, barely in. in. It was like halfway in. Yeah. I feel like I could take that out and be fine. Yeah. Certainly yeah. less effective than a flamethrower, you would think. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, oh, I thought it was, they could have done the same thing more logically. We needed a scene. It's probably on the cutting room floor of an, the Ugnot being like, <laughs> if you encounter a, a, a ring block. Make sure to... I was trying to come up with a fake name. It sounded like Rhino. <laughs> a rhinosaur. Make sure to stab it in its flim flam. <laughs> they also use... When he gets knocked down on the ground right before he takes the knife out, there's like a slow motion shot, yeah. which jumped out so much yeah. to me. And I, maybe there is an example that I can't think of, but it just looks so weird right. and so... De and also the music there sounds, even though it fits everywhere else, it just sounds very like 70s, 80s. It's this like synthy like doo -doo 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 thing right. that at first I thought was the breathing of That's, the I asked Alon while we were watching. Oh, I asked, yeah. is that the breathing or the music? And yeah. he said it was the breathing. I think it was the music, and but then it's like a weird framey slow motion shot. Yeah. That just looks. Bizarre. I mean, I feel like I'm trained to say it looks bad because we have the technology to do better slow motion than that now. But it just looks very. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, was, I agree. I th I thought it looked bad. Yeah. Like I I thought they could have had the same effect on that. I mean, they could. They didn't even need to do that. They could have just had him like move his head in a way where he clearly looked like dizzy. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it was like a weird like Wayne's World uh, yeah. <laughs> thing. Like it was just sort of uh, cartoon birds flying around. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I, honestly, I think what's happening is they're worried about the fact that he's always covering his face. And they're trying to figure out how to communicate to us how he's struggling. And you can't show Pedro Pascal like wincing or looking weak. So they're, they're, yeah. they, they, I, think, I think it works. But I feel like they're worried about it, so they go over the top to communicate those things to us. I, I think that overall, he's been doing a good job of expressing emotions through body language. You know, the way he moves his head, the way he moves his hands. Yeah. And I think I think they could have done the same thing here. Like, he could have just, like, shaken his head a bit, and, like, maybe wobbled a little, right. you know? But when he did that, and he took out his knife... As kind of his last stand, mm -hmm. it looked weird when yeah. it well, came out of nowhere. To me, it felt like it came out of nowhere just because I didn't think he took enough damage yet right. to be in that state. So yeah. I think you know that that his body language clearly made it seem like you know he doesn't have anything left in him. Yeah, I just didn't believe how he got to that yeah. point. If you had seen him without the mask on, though, like uh, head bleeding and like a skull like. <laughs> cracked, cracked a little bit <laughs> then it would be believable yeah sure yeah <laughs> i think i won but, that one I'm but sure. i think his helmet would be cracked if his skull was cracked mm, fair fair <laughs> yeah. okay so he goes into the cave and he retrieves the egg it's this weird looking thing it's all kind of like straggly hairy tries to wipe at one pointed this out to me yeah. he was like you see how he tries to wipe the mud off but then it realizes it's not mud. It's just what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like a coconut kind of, but like a gross furry pasta covered yeah. coconut. <laughs> or something. I wouldn't need it. Yeah, I wouldn't go near you that. Definitely thing. wouldn't need it. It cuts open very cleanly though. Yeah. 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 That was great. a nice swing. <laughs> yeah, and it looks like a like a a paint bucket almost thing yeah. inside. Like the yeah. inside is very very clean. It looks like an egg yolk. I, I like how the jaw yes. kind of right? the Jawa that was holding the egg didn't even flinch when his friend yeah. like slices <laughs> yeah. right in front of his face. <laughs> so so he brings it back to the Jawas. One of them grabs it, takes out a knife, slices it open. 
he tastes a little bit and he goes kind of nods his head like suka like yes yeah, suka <laughs> and they all immediately start taking yellow goo out and eating it <laughs> so you know who would have loved this the uh, uh, the Daniel Day Lewis spoof in South Park I'm a goo man. Oh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> I just like the idea that it's it's <laughs> I mean, they're chanting for it, which makes it sound like like my brain goes to like, oh, they're, it's like beer. They're like a fraternity that wants beer. And I just love the idea that that was the third place. They're like, we need your really valuable armor. Okay, no, you can't have that. All right, well, we need this crazy valuable asset that everyone dies to try to get. All right, well, I guess we'll do it for like a keg then. Yeah. Sure, you, you can have your stuff back for a keg. Actually, so I was reading up uh, again on Jawa history. And in one of the tie-in books, which is a, a recent one, so it's, it's part of the canon, apparently on Tatooine, kids who are underage, they'll dress up as a Jawa and kind of hide their face <laughs> to get into bars. That's <laughs> so. <laughs> so the Mandalorian, uh, re- when, he, when he gets back, uh, the Ugnaught is... Uh, he, p- he tells the Ugnaught, like, I'm surprised you waited. Ugnaught says, I'm surprised you took so long. And uh, on the ride back, uh, another another piece of dialogue that Alon was a big fan of. <laughs> um, the Ugnaught asks Mando, "Is it still sleeping?" About the baby Yoda, Mando says, "Yes." He says, was it injured? I don't think so, not physically. And then Alon's uh, favorite line: <laughs> "Explain it to me again." <laughs> I still don't understand what happened. Neither do I. <laughs> I don't know, that uh, exactly. exchange was just so weird. <laughs> yeah, very, very on the nose. Yeah, like, yeah, obviously. We all saw it. We don't need to hear that part, Yeah, right? right. Oh, and it's not even telling us what happened. It's literally just saying, like, I don't know what happened. It, well, yeah. Also, explain to me what happened again. Like, So he already told them what happened. <laughs> so, oh, wait, wait, okay, the rhino floated in the air. Right. Right. Explain again. it to me again. There, I, I, I mean, is, is it setting up that they don't? Like even though we know what the force is, that maybe they don't know what the force is. I think is. that's what they're trying to communicate. Because if you watch the current Star Wars movies, people know about the force. But in Force Awakens, they talked about it as this mythical thing. Like maybe it's not real. So I think they're establishing here the force is not something that everyday person knows about. Right. So I think there's there's a purpose to the scene. I mean, there's a purpose. It's just oddly delivered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all true. That's like when Han, Han is in so, the Falcon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so a quick montage where the Mando and uh, Ugnaught work together to fix a ship. At first, Mando's like, <laughs> it's going to take days to fix this. Ugnaught says, not if you help. Maybe it'll go faster. <laughs> and then Alun, uh, what was the part of the montage that you loved? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so... The Man- Mandalorian, the way he's repairing the ship, he's like putting bits of like sheet metal up on the wall, and then he just lightly taps with his left <laughs> fist twice, like it's doing anything at all. It's like that is not re-adhering it at all. Like that's not doing anything. Yeah. <laughs> dunk dunk. <laughs> it is funny how many, and I mean, I guess it's everything in Star Wars, but maybe it's more obvious in this because you're just following one character. But every single thing is just set up impossible task. Does it? Set up impossible task. <laughs> does it? It just it it's just a continual uh, of that. But I mean, it's great. It's a yeah. testament to which I think is what always Star Wars was like. It doesn't need to be a crazy elaborate story to be is very you know engaging. And the fact that it takes place in such an interesting world that there's all these tiny things that you keep wanting to know more about, or like, oh, what is that? Or I bet there's a whole backstory. You know, right? Yeah, and that's it's even the the story of. The Mandalorian having to protect the baby Yoda on this quest. You know, that's like a story we've seen so many times. But I'm excited to see it in the Star Wars universe. And there is the added mystery of who is the baby Yoda? What do people want with him? What are we going to learn about the species behind it? So it's, yeah, I don't mind seeing these things that we've seen versions of before. Uh, After they fix the ship... Uh, the, the Mandalorian tries to invite the Ugnaught to come with him. He's like, I could use a good uh, someone with your skills. And he says, I have worked a life to be free of servitude. Um, but uh, I know Lund's, Lund's laughing. I don't want to rip on the show too much because like, we love the show. But I just feel like we've had a rapid fire of criticisms the last few minutes. But So 
he said he thanks him. He thanks the Ugnot for helping him, and he offers him a part of the reward. The Ugnot says, "You are my guest. Therefore, I am in your service." Mandalorian asks him to be on the crew, and he says, "I have worked a life to be free, a lifetime to be free of servitude." <laughs> like seconds earlier, he was like, "I am in your service. Yep. I will never be in your service." <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> it's odd timing. Yeah. Uh, but I, I loved the relationship between the two of them. I was hoping he was going to accept that that offer. But, I mean, maybe we'll see him again at some point. Yeah. The show's been doing a great job of introducing these awesome characters, like IG-11, where you only spend a little bit of time with them and then move on. So, the uh, Ugnot says, wishes him luck, says of the baby Yoda, may it survive and bring you a handsome reward. I have spoken. <laughs> and that's his final line. Just very, very poignant. You know, if we don't see him again. Mando uh, flies off into space. Kind of turns back while he's flying. Shakes the pod to see if Baby Yoda will wake up. And then he does. And then uh, that's the end of the episode. So thoughts to be like the episode. Yeah. yeah I, love, I love Baby Yoda. It's great. Baby Yoda is awesome. <laughs> very cute. <laughs> Uh, what did you think about... So I mentioned the length of the episode earlier. It's kind of interesting. The first one was about 40 minutes. This one clocked in at about 30 minutes. And from what I hear, I think they do stick to that length. I mean, in in general, I'm enjoying them. So I feel like my, the easy answer is to say, like, oh, I wish they were longer. But if they're going to be... If the storytelling and every all the scenes are going to be, like, this tight, then I think I'm fine with it. I just think the thing that Star Wars stuff always has to tread is that it's not just... Like the the ride learning to ride the blurg right. thing, which if it was blurg. twenty scenes at blurg, sorry, if it was twenty <laughs> scenes in a row that that progressed that quickly from I can't do this, yes you can, yes I did, that is <laughs> that that quick, then I think it would I'd rather there would be a little bit longer and right. it would take longer to do things or something, but I'm fine with it in general. It's really yeah. good. So yeah, same here. But one interesting thing, if you look at the chatter online, which I know you've mostly avoided. People have tended to like the second episode more than the first episode. I've even, I've seen people who are iffy on the show, and the second episode is what convinced them. Yeah, this is a great show. Interesting. Yeah, that's surprising to me. I I, I thought both episodes were great, I, but I did like the first one a little bit more. I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah, same here. You just get more interesting stuff. Like I want to see more. You know, people in a cantina and weird characters yeah. that I want to know more about. And like, why are those stormtroopers dirty? Are they, did they used to be stormtroopers? Just right. using the arm. Like I like all that's again, I like all the other stuff too. I liked episode two. Yeah. Um, but a- episode two felt a lot like less essential. It felt more episodic, like a side quest. Right. So great. It was good. But yeah, to me, episode one, there was just a lot more there. Um, but yeah, I liked them both quite a lot. Especially because we're at the end of episode two, we're basically in the same exact place we were in at the end of episode one, more or less. He yeah, has pretty much. Yoda, yeah. They're, uh, you know, going on to whatever. I had one really dumb uh, that this definitely doesn't <laughs> hold up, but like a you know a, a shower thought style yeah. <laughs> theory on it, which is that what if Yoda, actual Yoda, knew the whole time that there was this other Yoda, and that's what he was actually saying to Luke when he was dying, because he says there is another oh. Skywalker. And he, But what if he wasn't saying there's another Skywalker? What if he's saying there's another, <laughs> comma, Skywalker? <laughs> like, there's another Yoda. Uh. You know, he's like, because you know, like Luke right before is something to the effect of like, yeah. you can't go. And he's like, what if it doesn't matter that I'm going because there's another Skywalker? Why would you phrase it that way? That's intentionally confusing. <laughs> What if you were a character that always phrased things in an intentionally confusing way? <laughs> That's his calling card. Wait, wait, in what movie did he say that? Was it Empire? Return of the Jedi? It's when he dies. And you haven't watched the updated version of Return of the Jedi on Disney Plus yet, right? Uh, correct. What if we rewatch it? Maybe they edited the dialogue. Oh, it's like there is another baby Yoda white <laughs> creature. <laughs> I could George Lucas would do that. I think if he had his wait. At- Brothers. At this point, at that point, did they know that Leia was Luke's sister already? When, when he says that, no, yeah. that's it's clear that that's what he's talking about. Oh, okay. Yoda's yeah. telling Luke that, that about <laughs> the sister that he doesn't know about. Oh, okay. <laughs> Luke, there is another like you, but also a baby <laughs> like me. <laughs> there is another, comma. <laughs> like if you came Jeez. to my apartment and I had one water out and you're like, oh man, I really would like a water. And I'd say, oh, there is another, Gil. 
<laughs> like, what? Yeah. There's another kill? <laughs> right. uh, any theories uh, on what Werner Herzog wants with the baby Yoda? I mean, I think he knows Yoda has the force and wants to exploit that somehow. And the doctor wants to cut him open and figure out how this force stuff works. At least experiments. Uh, yeah. Do you think that there is some remnant of the Empire around and Werner Herzog is part of it? Or do you think it's literally just those stormtroopers are either hired guns, they just have the outfits from when they used to fight for the Empire, or do you think there is some Empire presence here? I mean, in general, I, there's definitely remnants of the Empire mm-hmm. around. I don't know if I... I think he's probably a good guy, but maybe I'm just trained to... You think to he's like a good guy? Old white guys with you know, in cloaks like that are good guys in Star Wars. I don't know. That's true. Yeah, he could be the next Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan would never surround himself with stormtroopers, no matter what. I mean, unless that was like the best way to remain safe and dodge Imperial uh, interference was looking like you're the Empire oh, also. That's true. Didn't, they do, didn't Luke put on a stormtrooper? Right, yeah, you're okay, a little right. short for a stormtrooper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think he's definitely a bad guy because he was okay with killing Baby Yoda. That's true. Yeah, it's true. So. Well, the doctor seems like bad too, right? Like, who is the authority in that? Is he more important than the doctor guy, or is the doctor? I took him? it as he was, because if the doctor was more important, he could have put his foot down and said, "No, it's got to be alive." Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's kind of my. It's right now my assumption is that it's empire related. The the, the one qualm I had with that, or uh, one concern is that one of the cool things about what they can do with a show like this is explore the corners of the universe you don't see in the movies. And if this turns into, this is all tied into the overarching battle of the Empire versus the good guys, uh, I, I'll go with it, but part of me will be a little disappointed if this isn't just a smaller story that doesn't connect in some meaningful way to the, the Skywalker saga. Uh, I agree. I mean, I, I'm happy with some like small connections here and there, yeah. but like I think the movies are for the larger story. I like this narrower focused mm-hmm. story. Yeah. yeah, I don't want to be watching the next Star Wars movie and that baby Yoda comes yeah. out to save the day, and and, and everyone's like, "Who is that?" And I'm like, "Oh, you must not watch the Mandalorian <laughs> on Disney Plus." You know, I, I don't want to. I yeah. because I. Obvi- that's stupid for a million reasons, but I also like the idea that the movies can exist by themselves. Right. One know. of the executives, uh, I forget who, at some investor conference or something for Disney, was asked about the possibility of a Mandalorian movie, and his answer was so non unenthusiastic. He said, he's like, yeah, it's a pretty cinematic show. Like, I could see us, I don't know, maybe cutting it together into like a two-hour movie or something. Oh, I mean, we don't want to see like a cut-down version of the right. season shoved into theaters. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I could see uh, kind of a teenage Yoda showing up in Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> oh, as like God. the baby Groot. Like a, yeah. movie. <laughs> yeah. Were you about to say that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you've set it up, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about that they say Mando? Because to me, in the, the way he says it in the first scene is like, oh, this is like a racial slur. Like, you are right. not supposed to say that. Upa Ukata Mando. Right. Like, that <laughs> seems very offensive. But then the Ugnaught uses it too. Well, I if I don't even feel comfortable saying it. it. I feel like it feels... Yeah. It seems like the context in which you use it determines if it's an insult or like... Friendly. And maybe we should end here. Actually, yeah. <laughs> if you watch the live, if you watch the live stream I did on episode one, I purposely avoided saying Mando. And then when I heard Ugnot, the Ugnot say it in episode two, right? That's why I felt more comfortable saying it in this in this uh, in this forum. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I don't know. It just or it, I feel weird about it. Stop the presses. Jeremy feels weird about something. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. That's true. Thanks for listening, and if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to go into the Apple Podcasts app, leave us a rating, maybe leave us a review, and check us out on youtube.com slash onetakevids, link in the show notes, for our coverage of other shows like Watchmen and some movies like Terminator Dark Fate or The Irishman. Anyway, thanks for listening. I have spoken. Spoken.